Welcome, Ecom Logistics Nation. Thank you for joining today's episode. We're on a mission to share e commerce logistics insights, trends, successes, and challenges from the leaders and innovators in our space. You are a third party logistics operator. You might have 10,000 units of returns that show up in the warehouse every day across 50 or 100 or 500 different brands that you are providing employment services for. And then what needs to happen that most people don't know about is every one of those packages needs to be inspected. And that process in most facilities that we see is pretty offline and manual and unintelligent. Welcome, Ecom Logistics Nation. Today, we're thrilled to be joined by Kyle Bertin, co founder and CEO of Two Boxes. Kyle is passionate about using technology to make supply chains more efficient and sustainable. Putting that passion to work, Kyle launched Two Boxes in 2022 to solve the issues in the return space. Previously, Kyle held roles in strategy and operations at Outrider, Flexport, DeepScale, which was acquired by Tesla, and Deloitte. He holds a BA in economics from Northwestern University, where he was also a wrestler, and an MBA from UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business. Kyle, we're excited for the conversation. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Dan. Nanad. Really looking forward to having this conversation. Absolutely. Kyle, to kick things off, would love if you could share your journey in the logistics space and and the problem you saw specifically in the reverse returns market that motivated the launch of two boxes. As you guys mentioned in the intro, I started my career outside of the supply chain logistics world. I was in finance and and management consulting. And and then I got uh, recruited to join a, a publicly traded mining company where one thing led to another and I started building out their logistics business. That sort of hooked me. And then I moved into the broader logistics space after that. I spent time at Flexport, I spent time at a company called Outrider. And at Outrider, it might not sound at all related. Outrider builds autonomous yard trucks to automate distribution yards and, and intermodal rail, rail facilities, fulfillment center yards, that sort of thing. And funny enough, I was spending a lot of time inside of fulfillment centers when I was at Outrider. So I met my co-founder, Evan, at that company, Outrider, and we just I went deep on this. And we learned as much as we could about how do returns work today? What is the cycle from a Dan and Nanad's house back to a warehouse? And why does every return section look like a nightmare? Uh, that's really where we started. That's a great story. And, and it is an epic problem that we'll get into during the conversation. Being in operations for 20 years, when we had a prospect coming and touring a facility, the amount of time we would spend to clean up the returns area or the amount of time we'd be like, all right, move those 75 pallets up into the rack just to kind of clean it up and make it look uh, presentable. The amount of sites that I've seen in the corner of the facility where you have $50 million worth of inventory just sitting there, it's just a big pile that you are just trying to figure out what to do with or the levels of complexity that you go from e-commerce, general merchandise, apparel, to then your spectrum of electronics and components that go within that. And if you imagine some of the complexity that comes at the table, I, I mean, we get it why it is that way and why it is such chaotic. Oh, sure. But it, it's not the core, right? Like I'm in the business of selling things to the customer. So I mm-hmm. want to push more out. So when the things come back, it always takes lower priority, but there is a direct impact on the business to the bottom line, right? When you have that much sitting on hand and also the relationships with your vendors and vendor invoice settling and like just a whole bunch of things that go along with it. Returns is not a new problem. It's existed Mm -hmm. since the dawn of time, right? (laughs) Why now are we seeing so much momentum relative? Why wasn't it there as much 10 years ago even, right? Like you, you are seeing so many startups, so much movement, but like, why is it the right time right now? I will really break it down to returns follow the buyer journey. If you look back 10, 15 years ago, The number one thing that a brand needed to enable a consumer to do is to create and initiate a return and make it not the world's biggest pain in the butt to get a shipping label on a product and get it back to the warehouse. That first generation, put Amazon and Zappos aside because they're kind of like a unique beast, but that first generation of tools that came out was really focused in the beginning on how do I make it easy for Dan and Nod to initiate a return. Then I would say you started to see folks starting to figure out, okay, well, how do we then optimize some of the freight component of this? 
right? Of it's sometimes wasteful to be shipping parcels of you know products from all points in the U.S. back to one location. You've seen many more start to do consolidated freight offerings, and then what I would really argue is that the problems in the warehouse that are, we've started to see are because of a lot of this innovation. It has never been easier, faster, cheaper to initiate a return and get it back to a warehouse. And it has never been harder for, in my opinion, a warehouse to deal with all those returns. The, the number of, of technology providers that are getting those returns from kind of point A to point B has expanded greatly. So it's really difficult to integrate with all the data about those returns. And then let's not forget that the volume of returns has exploded. So if you go and look at online return volumes in the United States, over the last five years, online return of volumes in the United States have increased 8x. Now, why is that? It's because e-commerce penetration, largely driven by some big gains in the pandemic that dropped off and came back, went from basically low single digit percentage points to about 20 percentage points in the last 10 years. So huge expansion in online purchasing. And with online purchasing comes a lot of returns. People return online at somewhere in the range of about five to six X the rate that they return when they buy in store. So it's kind of this perfect storm of lots of innovation on the front end, lots of demand of returns because of the shift to e-commerce. And then the last thing that I like to call out is what is happening in the macro economy. The cost of capital has changed wildly in the last five years. Like retailers and brands have serious inventory holding costs that they didn't have five years ago. You guys had Jeff Walpov from Rider on the show a couple months ago, and he called this out. If you go and look at the income statement for the average 3PL or warehousing operation, their two biggest costs are labor and real estate. Both of those cost inputs are at all time highs. So when you start to put all this together, it's, there's a ton of volume, people can't deal with it, and it's costing everybody a ton of money. That is why returns have become a big focus area. I remember two years ago talking to the CFO of a publicly traded apparel company who essentially told me word for word that they didn't care about returns. That same company right now is trying to figure out how they find the money in the couch cushions across the organization because they know that they have to do it. I think this is a huge opportunity for 3PLs to differentiate themselves in this environment. I think a lot of people think about supply chains as cost centers. I totally disagree. I think cost centers are revenue generators and growth engines. And if you have a great supply chain, you have a great ability to generate revenue and growth. And that means not only shipping new orders out, but it also means managing that inventory effectively on both ends, on returns and turning those returns into inventory generation and revenue for the logistics providers as well. Absolutely. The Amazon effect is not just a consumer effect. It's also a logistic effect. So if you look at Amazon a marketplace or their FBA strategy for the longest time was, hey, Mr. Seller, you sell stuff. When it comes back, I go, wait, is it brand new in box? Put it back in stock or I'm gonna put it in a pile and you tell me what you want me to do. I got you two options. I can ship mm -hmm. it back to you for a cost or I'll go destroy it. Literally, the brand had three options or the merchandiser had three options. And you see Amazon making a huge pivot on that. Oh, you can also buy used and lightly used and scratched. And that's all Amazon now trying to dig into the opportunities of what can be done. We are okay with the Amazon strategy to say, listen, now I get your stuff back, I put it back in stock, or I just put it on the side. But each of those transactions are value generation for both the brand and the 3PL. If you start thinking about all of these other options of liquidation and return to vendor and B2B and resale opportunities, Love the space, man. Kyle, if you could describe the returns value chain, thinking about Kyle initiating a return of a product he bought online, just to give the audience a little perspective from uh, your point of view. Sure. Now let's put Amazon aside again, because Amazon is a little bit yes. of a different beast. Everything's vertically kind of integrated and built for their returns ecosystem. So typically the beginning of the return chain is one of us decides we don't want this product anymore. And so usually what you're going to do is you will go to a brand's website or you'll go in your email inbox and you'll say like, hey, I'm going to initiate my return. 
That will take you to typically a returns technology provider that focuses on you know, what in the industry is called an RMA or returns merchandise authorization. All of us will go to a website, we'll say why we're returning this thing, we'll print a shipping label or find a place to drop it off. And then that's what I call that first mile of the return journey. Once you drop that return off with the carrier, then that return is going to make its way typically back to a warehouse. Usually in probably 80 plus percent of the cases, if it's not a large retailer, uh, it will end up in a third party operated fulfillment center, typically the fulfillment center where that order was sent from. So now once our packages arrive at a warehouse, usually that third party operated facility in most cases is going to be uh, what I would refer to as a multi-tenant facility. There will be many brands whose products are shipping out of that facility and whose returns are coming to that facility. Now, what you'll see every day if you are a third-party logistics operator is uh, you might have 10,000 units of returns that show up in the warehouse every day across 50 or 100 or 500 different brands that you are, are providing fulfillment services for. And then what needs to happen that most people don't know about is every one of those packages needs to be inspected and uh, what's called dispositioned, right? You need to inspect it to confirm, hey, did Nanad send me back the right product that he said he sent back? And it, what condition is it in? And what can I do with that? Uh, today, that process in most facilities that we see is pretty offline and, and manual uh, and unintelligent. And then at the end of that whole chain, a disposition decision will be made about, hey, did Dan's uh, return, can it be returned to stock as first in quality? And if not, does it need to be, you know, donated, recycled, liquidated, entered into a resale channel? Yeah, perfectly said. Yeah, very Thank well you. explained. So that's the chain. You got inspection grading and things that are going to happen after. And then there is the return intent and actually bringing the product in. Correct. So there's actually one other step I missed in there, which is value-added services or refurbishment. So maybe cleaning an item or repairing an item or that sort of thing. That's another area that happens in the warehouse. So, okay, how do I every day deal with being able to understand what's in the piles of returns that are coming into my facility? Actually being able to visualize them into the facility, predict them, which is a product that we offer. Then how do I enable Dan and Nanad, if they're two people who it's their first shift on the job, how do I enable them to process any return from any of those brands according to that brand standard? Then those coordinating those value-added service and refurbishment workflows. So being able to instruct Nanad with, hey, this shirt came back and it has pet hair on it. So here's how you lint roll it. Here's the process if it's successful. Here's if it's not successful. All that SOP management. And then the last part is automating those disposition decisions and then communicating that information back to all of the stakeholders. The brands need better visibility to what's happening to their inventory. And so that's really interesting, specifically on the grading, the grading and the inspection side, because the messy middle, pass it off to the WMS. And for decades that we have had modern, what I would call modern architecture WMSs in play, these WMSs have always had a returns component to it. But as a matter of fact, I've known even the tier one solutions, just how the warehouses thought as returns as a secondary problem, even the WMS has treated it as such, which meant it was very simple rule logic. And then you would basically say for everything in this warehouse, good is equal to back to stock, bad is equal to refurbish or liquidate and ugly is destroy. And then you say go. Right. That's mm -hmm. not how reality works. That has been the problem. So I know where we came from. What innovations have happened at this point that changes from where we used to be to today in that return grading combination? Yeah. So if you go back to early 2010s, when a lot of the largest returns technology uh, providers were just getting started, just how we build software and the, the tools that we have access to and how quickly we can launch and how easily we can integrate, that's changed dramatically. And, and how do I make a great experience, an intuitive experience for the person in the warehouse? Because that person in the warehouse, they are typically somewhere between 18 and 45 years old. They typically don't speak English as a first language. They are used to using very modern technology and they might spend five, six months in a role before they go to another warehouse or go to a better job or whatever. So how do you enable it to be really easy to onboard, easy to understand, easy to use? And I think there's a ton of opportunity out there for people to build great 
user experiences and software. AI and, and machine learning and other tools that are uh, very easily integrated nowadays can do a lot to help with SOP and workflow management and sort of intelligence along that chain. Yeah, I just want to highlight really well put and specifically, I want to touch on that experience design thing that you just mentioned and how much the entire industry absolutely did not care about experience design and I, I get it, right? A, a lot of the older stuff ran on like green screens and whatnot in the universe. And Still now, does, we have, by the way. Like, those things are absolute beast at what they can do. And so I got nothing against TS400 and green screens, by the way. But if you think about a warehousing environment, and if you are specifically in e-commerce, it's hundreds, if not thousands of people that are constantly interacting with this screen flow that's in front of them. And... Somehow nobody cared about it, like which is absolutely ridiculous. Just make that one UX change and take everything else under the hood and you got a new thing that can scale really fast. Yeah, well, I think the reason this happens with respects is a lot of software in the industry, in my opinion, has been built by people who haven't set foot in the warehouse before and don't take enough time to do that. So for example, we launched localization. And so the first language that came up is Spanish because that is the, the language of choice for the vast majority of warehouse workers. And I think you learn through this process of what does a good user experience look like? Mm -hmm. And how can we build towards that instead of just saying everybody has a crappy front end and that is what it is. I, I can't agree with you more on that, right? Like it's just spending time on the floor. And we've spoken about this on the podcast so many times about the technical and product and design people spending time on the floor. But I think the problem is leadership that cannot teach people empathy. It's a matter of having right leadership to say, how do I show my people how this is done? And you're, you're, yeah, of course, you're not going to get software developers that have actually ended up working inside the warehouse or user experience designers that have worked inside the warehouse. You have to tell them that you need to go there and spend time and show them it's quality of life impact for an individual. I think empathy is a great word. And then also just curiosity. I remember like it was yesterday, it was April of 2022. Somebody who's been on this podcast before actually went out of their way to let me and my co-founder come into many of their facilities in Southern California. And one of the first things we noticed was that there was a woman in the corner taking literally hundreds of photos every day on her personal phone downloading, uh, sending them to her work email, downloading them and putting them into an Excel spreadsheet for a brand of all the damage returns. I remember Evan, my co-founder, walking out of that visit and being like, we got to help her. And so if you go in and you're curious and you see what's happening, the solutions kind of appear. The brands will tell you what they need to really solve. You don't have to go through a startup accelerator to find a great problem to solve. At least they weren't taking a, printing out pictures and then writing a form <laughs> and then <laughs> eventually them, faxing yeah. one form yeah, exactly. at a time on the return. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So. And I agree with what you said. Yeah. Love it. Kyle, I want to switch things up uh, for a second, get your perspective on some of what we talked about earlier, our brands are looking for every quarter nickel and dime that they can. They're leaning in heavily to getting their cart size as large as humanly possible. So we're seeing a lot of bundling. We're seeing a lot of unique sales promotions. Again, trying to get the number of SKUs, the number of items, the number of products into a box. So when you think of that from a returns perspective, that just increases the complexity, right? Because maybe you are scanning a barcode or the SKU and it's representing that's come back, but maybe there should be four items associated with that SKU. Maybe there was a parent-child relationship that got it out the door. Any strategies you have for businesses that are facing that? Because we're seeing that more and more in warehouses now. It's not just a t-shirt, right? It's three, four, five things in the box. So. Just your perspective on how to attack as the returns are getting more complex. They, they certainly are getting more complex and we're seeing the same. And actually I'll call it like bundled and kitted returns are kind of one of the top things in our roadmap right now that we're, we're building better and better solutions for. Uh, I'll be really transparent. We're not even close to where we want to be on bundled and, and kitted return capabilities. I think one of the first things that we can help with just out of the box and, and what I think people need to be thinking about is if you have a best of breed, you know, returns management provider on the front end, you should be able to understand what is actually supposed to be coming back in that order. The second thing where it gets really complex is I see today kitted products or bundled products 
where if there's one thing missing from the kit or something damaged in the kit or whatever it is, then everything goes into the discard pile or goes into the donate pile or whatever it might be. And that's obviously a huge waste of inventory, but it can start to get you know pretty complex as I'm sure you guys appreciate around how do I break a parent uh, SKU into a child SKU and then you know maybe restock a child SKU from a parent you know kitted bundle. That starts to get you know more complex. It's not absolute you know rocket science, but it's something that you know you have to do well or else you're going to end up with a you know kind of inventory nightmare in your hands. Um, the first thing is just being aware of the problem and and how you can solve it either with intelligent people and processes or ultimately software. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. I don't know if it was intended or if you thought you would see as much, but obviously there's a lot that's being said about fraud and abuse. And what what are you seeing and what, what are these brands and retailers facing that maybe are now being uncovered with the software solutions that are available in the space? to identify fraud and abuse because we all hear about the empty box or the box that comes with rocks instead of cookware, whatever it is, people try to get slip something through. So just would love your perspective on what's being seen and what are some opportunities to course correct and identify it? Oh, I mean, we've seen anything you can think of. We've seen roughly speaking, you know, we'll see about 10 to 50 returns that go through two boxes that have clear evidence of fraud or abuse. I like to think about fraud as kind of very clear, hey, empty box return. Somebody bought, uh, you know, we here's an example, cookware customer where there was a 12 piece set valued at over $1,500 that was returned that had a, a literally a stack of auto trader magazines in it. That's clear fraud, right? Now, another option would be I, I, I returned the cookware uh, or I returned some cookware, but it's not that brand's cookware, right? So we see a ton of this in apparel. Right? So people who buy a ton of product, wear it all, and then return it being very clearly used and abused. So there's a women's athletic apparel brand whose returns go through two boxes where we see a lot of people who seem to be renting their workout clothes, essentially. So that's abuse. Wash it before sending it back. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Someone's got to inspect <laughs> yeah. it. Yes, yeah. so we see a lot of that. There's really a couple ways that, that I would recommend brands combat. There's a lot of information that you can start to just track in your returns management uh, system. And in, if you're in Shopify or Salesforce, Commerce Cloud, or wherever that is, about your order volumes. And you can just see suspicious trends, right? So you can see like, is somebody buying $10,000 worth of merchandise at once and then returning? like a significant amount of it, that's probably an issue, right? Um, there's very basic things you can be doing by just analyzing the data that you have on hand. There's other solutions identifying fraud just based on purchase and credit card behavior and things like that. And then on the ex post side, I think it really revolves around your warehouse capability, really understanding what returns are actually coming back as there's significant signs of fraud and abuse just from what's coming back and what warehouse workers are seeing. I think the unfortunate reality here is that if warehouse staff doesn't have the right tools to do this in a scalable fashion, they're just not going to do it. And then last but not least, uh, there is fraud that occurs in warehouses. And it's sad to say that, but it is true. And so having a good system of records can help you identify things that might even be happening kind of inside of the warehouse. Yeah. Yes, it happens. And it happens at a very large scale. And yeah. when you hear that term, oh, it fell off the back of the truck. That's what we are talking about. The Wall Street Journal had a great piece about this and things that were happening in Amazon facilities. So this doesn't just affect small to medium sized 3PLs. This affects huge retailers and huge logistics providers as well. So I think the good news is that there are tools out there and that if you have the ability to collect data on what's happening in your operations, you have the ability to spot outliers and you can, of course, correct from there. Absolutely. And there is also the buy a Nike and send the knockoff version back. Right? Oh, geez. You know what? I just have to tell this story because you brought this up. I thought I had seen everything and this kind of blew my mind. So there, there's a brand that told me about an issue. They're a very high end apparel brand. And there's a kind of new apparel entrant that tends to sell like dupes of their products. They yeah. don't brand them as dupes, but they, they're very closely you know designed to be. And this brand is dealing with a huge issue where people will buy the high-end version of the product and the dupe version of the product. They will actually take the label out of the high-end product and sew it into the dupe product. And then they will return the dupe, keep the high-end, get their yeah. money back. And then what ends to make matters even worse, the dupes end up back into pickable inventory because their returns staff doesn't have a good tool today 
to be able to identify the real from the fake. And so then they're sending dupes out to customers who ordered a $500 piece of apparel, right? So it's causing quite a nightmare. So there's all sorts of fraud vectors. There are books on Amazon about how to defraud retailers. There are Discord communities, Telegram communities. Uh, It's probably going to get worse before it gets better, in in my opinion. Uh, And and I'll say this. At at this point, uh, for us to capture fraud, it's always going to be like you're constantly trying to battle and we are always going to try and like evolve on. But if you were to look at the alliance that is required between various different providers within the end system, I think that's really critical because the upstream data products that are out there, they have a more broader metadata view of individuals beyond a brand as an example. And the, the commerce channels have even better view and credit card channels have even better view. So when you consolidate all of that, being able to do that scoring and be able to bring it down to say, I know this person, like confidence level is equal to A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It's like, how much am I actually scrutinizing this given return? But for that to happen, that ecosystem needs to be that partnership ecosystem. We need that type of understanding in the broader ecosystem of return logistics to say, what is it that we all ally to at least? Let's compete but we need a level of alliance to be able to counter and and fight this. Yeah, and I think it's a huge call out in general logistics and the broader supply chain. It's such a massive industry and not everybody can do everything. And I think it's silly to try. And so partnering is the right way for the vast majority of supply chain and logistics organizations to serve their customers effectively. And by sharing, we can, at the end of the day, benefit the merchant. And that's really, I think, the most important thing here because if the merchants win, the logistics providers are going to win, the technology providers are going to win. Absolutely. But there is like an aspect of metadata understanding and sharing, like the way some of the banks come together to counter fraud. Like if you look at the banking sector, that's what they do. It's a great, let's yeah, it's compete, a great parallel. But like let's pull metadata together to try and figure out and look at how much fraud reduction has happened. There was a period in time like 2005 to 10. I was canceling credit cards every two years because th- there was always <laughs> something happening on a fraud, like some gas station somewhere that it, it got swiped. And now you see that getting reduced really well. I've not had a fraud in the last 10 years, I should say. Yeah. That's what, and please do not now target me. Don't <laughs> so give your listening. credit card number out. <laughs> exactly. <right? Yeah. laughs> but that is where the opportunity lies, right? Be able to address that particular need in that manner to say, okay, can we all at a metadata level come together like an exchange of high level information that can then be passed down to validation touch points? I mean, would love that, by the way, that's my take. Yeah. We talk a lot about fraud from a defensive perspective and sort of a trying to disincentivize bad behavior. The truth is that's really difficult to do in a lot of ways. And I think there's also a huge opportunity for folks to be in good behavior. How do we actually, uh, a good returner, right? To share their information with companies like Two Boxes and others where, hey, yeah, I'll opt in, I'll share my info, I'll do all these kinds of things so that I can get free returns or promotional pricing or access to products that I wouldn't otherwise get. And I think that there's a lot of innovation that the industry can focus on that front end, on that checkout experience of how do we incentivize somebody to be a good returner here? And, and I think that's an, an untapped area that, that people should start to focus a lot more on. I agree. Love it. Well, listen, Kyle, on that note, it has been an absolute pleasure having you with us today. As we wrap up here, I want to give you the opportunity to share with the audience where they could go to learn more about Two Boxes, what social platforms they could go to follow you. Yeah. Well, again, thanks for having me, guys. You can check us out at just TWOboxes.com. I'm on LinkedIn, decently active on there, and our, our company LinkedIn page as well. Check us out on our website. Check us out on LinkedIn. And seriously, we just love meeting logistics providers in particular. If you're interested, please reach out and and we'd love to come by and see your facility and talk shop. Fantastic. Amazing. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks, Thanks. guys. Hi, I'm Ninad Acharya, CEO and co-founder of Fulfillment IQ. And I'm here with... Dan Call, CRO and partner at Fulfillment IQ. We're the team behind the Ecom Logistics Podcast. 
Our mission is to provide you with genuine insights from our work alongside logistics leaders to help you improve your supply chain. In the Ecom Logistics podcast, we share the knowledge and the insights we've gained from working alongside amazing brands, retailers, 3PLs, and VCs, so you can make the most out of your supply chain journey. If you like what you're hearing, we truly appreciate your support with a five-star rating on your favorite podcasting channel. Your feedback not only keeps us going, but also helps others find the podcast. If you think Fulfillment IQ can assist you, or if you have an idea related to logistics, just reach out to us on LinkedIn. We're always up for a chat and ready to explore new possibilities together. Stay tuned to the Ecom Logistics Podcast on your favorite podcast platform for fresh and practical insights into e-commerce and logistics. Until next time, let's keep making a difference.